All right, we are in Isaiah chapter 31, if you'd like to open up there. Isaiah 31, and we're going to start here in verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. This is really a continuation of the message from uh, chapter 30. As you know, there's no chapter breaks in the original manuscripts. And so really chapter 30 and 31 are both talking about this issue of Egypt and of the people of Judah, the children of Judah or of Israel that were in Judah, the southern kingdom. They were being besieged by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians were terrible. They were fearsome. Historians tell us that the Assyrians used psychological warfare, much like we saw ISIS doing over in uh, Syria and in Iraq, where they were, you know, ISIS was beheading people. They were cutting people's hands off. Uh, They were trying to terrorize the people into submission. And so uh, warfare is brutal and warfare was was a very brutal business and the Assyrians were as cruel as they come Uh, and nobody could oppose them everywhere that Assyria went which would be modern day Iraq Nineveh uh, is in modern day Iraq northern Iraq uh, southern Iraq would have been ancient Babylon but Assyria was um, unstoppable no nation could stop them everywhere they went they destroyed their enemies Uh, they already had destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and carried them away captive. And Israel was a much bigger, more powerful nation than little Judah in the south. And so if Israel couldn't stand up militarily against the Assyrians and they were captured and they were taken into captivity uh, to be spread out throughout the Assyrian empire, uh, Judah thought they really had no chance with their army to stand up to the Assyrians. And really, they really didn't have a chance to fight the Assyrians. They weren't strong enough. Uh, The Assyrians would intimidate, as we're going to see as we go through Isaiah, we're going to see more of the history of this invasion of Assyria. It's it's, it's detailed for us uh, in chapter 33 and onward up through about chapter 37 of Isaiah. We'll look at it in in, in great detail. But what what they would do is they would give the people a chance to basically surrender. And they would say, if you surrender, we're going to let you live. We're going to just move you somewhere else. And we're going to basically... Uh, remove you from your land and we're going to put you in another land and you're going to be part of our empire but we're not going to kill you and we're not going to maim you uh, and we're not going to hurt your your women and your children but if you fight us if you resist us we are going to obliterate you they would take the women and they would of course rape the women they would take the children and they would make the children as soldiers or as slaves uh, and they would take the men And they would just humiliate the men. They wouldn't just kill all the men, but they would mutilate the men. This is what the ancient historians tell us that the Assyrians did. Uh, They would cut off the ears. They would poke out the eyes of the men. They would cut off their tongues. They would cut off their, their hands. Sometimes they'd cut off their big thumbs so they couldn't ever hold a sword again to fight them. Or cut off their big toes so they would never be able to run again. And they, they used this sort of psychologi- psychological warfare. They'd cut off their nose. That's where the term comes, cut off the nose to spite the face. They would literally cut the noses off of people uh, so that everybody would know if you mess with the Assyrians and you lose, this is what it looks like. And it was a terrible thing to lose uh, to Assyria. And nobody had been able to beat Assyria. No army had been able to oppose them for like 20 years at this point. Everywhere the Assyrians went, they won. They conquered. And uh, of course, God was using Assyria as his instrument of judgment against his people because they had gone after other gods and they'd gone after idols, as you are aware. And so God was basically trying to get his people to turn to him and to trust in him by allowing the Assyrians to come and to besiege the city. Not only were they there 
coming to besiege the city of Jerusalem, which was a walled city, so they were within the walls. But the Assyrians were encamping a huge army, almost 200,000 soldiers, right at their gates. And they knew that they wouldn't be able to last, that they would starve them out. Uh, and, and so things looked pretty bleak for, um, for Judah. And yet God was saying, you don't have to fear them. Turn to me, and I am going to defend you. Turn to me, and I am going to protect you. Uh, and, and what they were doing, instead of turning and trusting in the Lord to defend them and seeking the Lord with prayer and fasting and really humbling themselves before God, throwing away all their false idols, instead what they did is they got all their money together, a whole bunch of money from the treasury, and they sent it on camels and donkeys down to Egypt to go buy an army of mercenaries, basically, to come in and to defend them and to fight against the Assyrians for them. And the prophet Isaiah was warning them about this and saying, do not go to Egypt to hire the Egyptians to come and fight for you. Uh, you're, you're trusting in the arm of the flesh. You're trusting in man instead of trusting in the Lord and trusting in God. Now, what is, what is interesting is the Lord would ultimately wipe out the entire Assyrian army because the king was a good king, King Hezekiah. He listened to the prophet Isaiah who wrote this book. And the king humbled himself before God and the Lord delivered Judah from their enemies by wiping out one angel of the Lord, wiped out 185,000 Egypt or uh, Assyrian soldiers in one night. So just obliterated their entire army. Uh, and really broke the back of the Assyrian Empire from that point on. The king actually was then murdered when the king of Assyria went back home. His sons murdered him and took the throne from him. Uh, and, and so God wiped out their enemies. And so, but, but later what would happen is the Babylonians would come about 100 years later with Nebuchadnezzar uh, and, and would besiege the city again. But this time they didn't turn to God. Uh, they turned to their idols this is when Jeremiah the prophet was pleading with them, the weeping prophet, lamentations, just crying out and saying, turn back to God, you know, get rid of your idols, stop injustice and adultery and all the things that you're doing and stop playing church. And they wouldn't listen to the prophet of God at that time. With Isaiah and Hezekiah, they did listen to the prophet of God and God saved them. hundred years later, they didn't listen to the prophet of God, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, who were prophesying at that time, and they were destroyed by their enemies. Um, and so... Uh, History is replete with, with all of the archaeology. You could go to Israel today and you could see actually the judgment of God upon the nation of Judah. There's layers of the tells, these big mounds that they dig down, and there's like 17 different civilizations. They just build on top of one civilization after another in the Middle East, in the ancient world. Somebody would lose a war and they would just kind of, it'd be all rubble, and then they'd just take the rubble and they'd build another city on top of it. And so they could dig down in these tells and they could go down and see the different civilizations, and they've actually uncovered the tells from the time of the Babylonians when the city of Jerusalem was burned to the ground. And what they found inside the houses in Jerusalem were hundreds and hundreds of idols inside the houses of the people of Judah. They were worshiping other gods, even as God was warning them that if they didn't cast away their idols, that they were going to burn. And, and basically, God was already warning them about this even in Isaiah, about the fact that they should cast their other gods, their false gods away, turn to the true and living God, and be saved. We read in chapter 30 and verse 1, because again, for context, 30 and 31 are really the same sort of theme about Egypt and not going to Egypt. And we read this in Isaiah 30, verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel but not of me, who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk to go down to Egypt, and they have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of the Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame, and trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation." For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people who could not benefit them or be help or benefit, but a shame and also a reproach. Verse 6, the burden against the beasts of the south through a land of trouble and anguish from which came the lioness and the lion, the viper and the fiery flying serpent. 
They will carry their riches on the backs of young donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people who shall not profit. Verse 7, for the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore, I have called her Rahab him Shebeth. And so God was warning them. They were taking the treasures of the temple and they were going on camels and donkeys backs through the Sinai Peninsula, a dangerous desert, uh, with bandits and, 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 and everything else and criminals and robbers. And they were taking all this money of, of God's house from the treasury to go and buy an army from the Egyptians to come and to fight against the Assyrians. And God was saying, it's not going to work out for you. It's going to fail. The, the arm of the flesh is going to fail you. You're putting your hope in Egypt and you are going to be sorely disappointed. The Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose, the Lord says in chapter 30. And that's exactly what uh, indeed did happen. So we go back to 31 in verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and they rely on horses. Who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men, and they are not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall and he who is helped will fall down and they will all perish together. They were turning to Egypt for assistance. They thought that the Egyptians were going to save them. And the interesting thing is, is that the Assyrians were already, the Assyrians were not stupid. They knew that this is what Judah was doing because they'd already conquered about 40 of the cities of Judah by this time that this was written, and they were getting closer and closer and closer to the city of Jerusalem. They'd taken all the walled cities of Judah. They'd already conquered uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel. And so the Assyrians knew what Judah was doing. And so what they did is they went to Egypt and just obliterated the Egyptian uh, horsemen and their, and their cavalry and, and their chariots. They just destroyed them. And then they came back and they, and they made war against Judah again. So God is trying to warn them. God is trying to save them. He's trying to help them. But Egypt in the scriptures is always a picture of the world for the child of God. Egypt is a picture of the world. Pharaoh is a type of Satan who's the God of this world. It's a type of the flesh, of living after the flesh. Egypt represents the flesh. It represents the world. It represents the devil. It represents our old life. And so Basically, the application for us today is that we are not to go back to the things of this world. Once we've been set free from the bondage and the slavery of sin and the hell that was our reality before we came to Christ. And you remember before you were saved what a nightmare your life was and what a nightmare my, my life was before I came to Christ. Why would I ever want to go back to that again? Why would I want to go back to alcohol or to drugs or to go to Vegas and thinking that if I, you know, spend all my money uh, at the craps table or at the pool of the Flamingo Hotel or whatever, that somehow I'm going to find happiness and I'm going to find peace and I'm going to find joy. No, you're going to find disaster. You're going to find trouble. You're going to find problems. You go to Sin City and what goes, in, goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, you know, there's a lot of bodies buried out there in the deserts of Vegas too. There's people that just disappear. You know, it, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens when you go back to the things that God has saved you from and delivered you from, and he's cleaned you up and he's washed you off and he's set your feet upon the rock. Why would you ever go back to wallow in the mire? Like the pig after its wash goes back to roll around in the mud or the dog returns to eat his vomit. Uh, Peter says about the believer who goes back to his old ways after God has washed him and cleaned him and set him free. And so this is, a, this is always a type when we see Egypt in the scriptures and the children of God running back to Egypt to get bailed out or to find help or to, you know, go and find assistance. Um, it, it's always a disaster. It's always a mistake, especially for the children of Israel who had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. The Egyptians were going to annihilate them as a race. It was a genocide. They were killing all the baby boys by throwing the baby boys into the Nile River. You remember, that's why Moses uh, was saved, because his mother thought he was beautiful and refused to throw him into the river to be eaten by the crocodiles and put him in a basket. And then he became the savior uh, of God's people. 
So it was, it, it was something that God told them over and over again. They are never to return to Egypt again. And so even in the idea that they were sending money down to buy an army or a uh, cavalry from and horsemen and chariots from the Egyptians was just an abomination to God. We read, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, back in the Law of Moses, Way before, hundreds and hundreds of years before, about 1400 B.C., so maybe 700 years before the story that we're reading about took place, God spoke through Moses the prophet and, and, and said this in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 14. So this is even before they came into the promised land and crossed over the Jordan River, right after they'd come out of Egypt. He says, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it, and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but, speaking of the king, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart be turned away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests and Levites, and it shall be with him. And he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted uh, above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So God showed Moses this hundreds of years before it happened about what was going to happen when the children of Israel would come into the promised land that they would want a king, they would not want a theocracy anymore where God was ruling over them through an appointed man like Moses or through the judges uh, for the 400 years of the judges where it was a judge who was like uh, Samuel was the last judge actually before he anointed the first king who was King Saul. But the people didn't want the judges. They didn't want a, a Moses model. They didn't want uh, a theocracy where God was ruling over the people through a man like a judge like Moses or like Samuel they wanted a king like the nations around them and God warned them you can have a king but he's got, here's the specifics and when you get a king he's not to multiply horses he's not to run down to Egypt to buy horses guess the Egyptians had the most beautiful horses in the world at that time and chariots and so forth and, uh, and he's not to marry a bunch of wives because all of these wives are going to turn his heart away to worship other gods. He's not to multiply gold and silver because then he's going to put his faith in his gold and his silver instead of putting his trust in me. And as you know the history, Moses wrote this in 1400 B.C. And within just a few hundred years, uh, the children of Israel were already, uh, uh, you know, uh, up to their elbows in all of the things that God had told them not to do whether it was marrying too many wives like Solomon had a thousand wives or multiplying horses or multiplying gold and silver. And so in essence, the kings led the nation away from God by disobeying. And of course, God is saying you should put the word of God first if you're a king. You know, you should, you should read the law of God every day, all the days of your life. You should learn to fear the Lord and to carefully observe all the words of this law and these statutes. And so that's, you know, good advice for anybody who's in leadership of any organization. You know, put God first and uh, trust in the Lord and stay in God's word and try and obey what you know uh, is true and what is right. But God had specifically warned them not to return to Egypt to multiply horses, and this is exactly what they were doing. And so the Lord was not happy about that. We read in Psalm chapter 20 and verse 7, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And so we're not to put our hope in man. We're not to put our hope in the flesh. We're not to put our trust in our military or in our weapons of war. Ultimately, we are to put our trust 
in God, in the Lord as God's people. In Psalm 33 and verse 16, we read this. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Um, the judgment of God is going to fall upon a nation that has rejected God, that has turned away from God and turned to other gods. That was true for Israel. It was true for Judah. It'll be true for the United States of America too. We think we have the most powerful military in the world. Wait until our economy collapses, which is what the European bankers are trying to do to us through this whole Great Reset thing, uh, is to put us into so much debt. We're at $30 trillion now. Our national debt is now $30 trillion. Thank you to President Biden for just adding another $2 trillion to our existing $28 trillion national debt. That's, that's trillion with a T. $30 trillion is what we owe other foreign banks of other countries. And we have to pay that money back with interest. And the bankers get to determine the interest rates. So we owe them $30 trillion, And the central bankers of Europe, primarily, and the, and the Federal Reserve banks here, which are run and owned by the central bankers of Europe here in the United States, they get to decide when it's time to start raising interest rates. Well, if they just raise interest rates to 10%, that's $3 trillion a year in interest. We can't pay that. There's no nation in the world that could pay $3 trillion a year in interest. So this is how it's going to go. And they are going to, their goal is to destroy the economies of the world, especially the United States economy, by 2030 for the Great Reset. And so we may think we have this powerful military and we have this powerful army and this powerful name. We certainly do. We have the most powerful military in the world. But it's only because we have the most powerful economy in the world. And the whole world uses the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency for all the banking, all the oil transactions uh, all over the world are, are, are settled in U.S. dollars. That's going to go away. It's all going to cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is, is a type of what is coming. The technology is being tested with Ethereum, with Bitcoin, and all of these cryptocurrencies. It's all to get this technology in play so people can get used to it. And then they're going to greatly devalue our money. By raising interest rates, raising taxes, the economy is going to drop. Our dollar's not going to buy as much as it used to. It's going to cost you more for everything. We're already seeing that with inflation, with food and gas and housing and everything else. Inflation is through the roof. It's just going to get worse because they're pumping more and more money, trillions of dollars into our economy. But it's money we have to pay back at some point with interest. And, uh, and, and that's when our military uh, is, is no longer going to be the most powerful military in the world. And then you know, we won't be able to lean on our military anymore to defend us against our enemies. And make no mistake about it, we have a lot of people that hate America. I don't know if you've ever traveled around the world. Everywhere I go, they hate America. Everywhere I've been, they hate America. They like Americans. They like Americans. You go to London. They hate America in London, in England. But they like you if you're from America. They wonder if you know, like, a movie star or something, or if you've ever been to Hollywood, or, you know, they, they, they think, you know, Broadway and, and movies and things like that. So they like Americans, they like our money when we travel, but they don't like the United States of America. There's not a lot of countries that are going to feel sorry for us if we're conquered someday by a foreign power, quite frankly, uh, even our allies in Europe. So um, we just have to understand this, that it's it, it, a, a horse... Or, or your military, or your weapons, or your, you know, AK-47, or your AR-15, or whatever arsenal you think you have at home that's going to protect you from the end of the world scenario, or an invasion of another army or something. It's like, if you don't have God first, all your weapons aren't going to mean anything. They'll just send a drone over to your house and just blow your house away with a drone or something. I mean, really, think about it. We can't, we can't fight uh, against another foreign army if our army is weak and not defending us. It's just not going to happen. And so I think that a lot of times we are just as guilty as Israel. We're just as guilty as, as Judah. We're not trusting in the Lord. We're trusting in our economy, in the U.S. dollar. We're trusting in our stock market. We're trusting in the Social Security system or the Medicare system or the Medi-Cal system. Uh, we're trusting in our pension funds. We're trusting in the banking system, and we're trusting in, the, in our military prowess. But all of that could change in a very, very short period of time. All you have to do is study history to see that that is true. And the biggest problem is that we are turning our back on God as a nation. That's our biggest problem. You know, we could have a really weak military, but if we were a really godly nation, I would feel very secure. 
if we were a godly nation that loved and feared the Lord. But we're a godless nation that doesn't fear God, that lives like God is not real and doesn't exist. All of our entertainment is godless. Not only is it godless, it's wicked. So, I mean, it's just, and we sit and watch this stuff. We pay money to have this stuff come into our homes, and it's wicked, it's godless, and we're, we're being entertained by it, and we're God's people. So, it, at some point, the house of cards, I believe, is going to come crashing down, and we just need to be prepared for that. In Psalm 52, in verse 7, we read this. Here is the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. So this is, this is a man who is going to fall under the judgment of God is what's being described here in Psalm 52. But they're saying of, of this wicked man, the one who boasts in evil, the one whose tongue devises uh, destruction, uh, the one who works deceitfully, the one who loves evil more than good, lying rather than speaking truth or righteousness, who love devouring words, who has a de- deceitful tongue. God says this is what's going to happen. Here is the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. God is going to destroy you forever, verse 5. He's going to take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. So the, 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 the one who is wicked, the one who is arrogant uh, in their wickedness, the one who speaks lies rather than righteousness, who has devouring words of deceitful tongue, who will not make God his strength, but will trust in the abundance of his riches. It's just not going to end well for that individual or for that nation. In Psalm 147, one more psalm about this, because this was a, a, a big theme in the scriptures. Psalm 147 and verse 10 says this, he does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. And so uh, we shouldn't delight in the strength of, of the horse or of the chariot or of the tank or of the military uh, or, or in the, the pleasure in the legs of man, like the strength of your army. Um, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and in those who hope for his mercy. God just wants us to be his people. He, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. God wants us to turn to him. And when things are falling apart, he's the best place to turn. He's the best person to turn to. Run to Jesus. He can handle anything that you're facing. There's nothing too difficult for God. But we often run to God last. We run to everybody else and everything else first. And when nothing else works, then we pray and we turn to God. You know, and, and, and it ought not to be that way. We should run to God first because he's the only one that can save you uh, from the troubles that, that we face in this life. So back in Isaiah 31 and verse 2, after God has rebuked them for going down to Egypt to rely on horses and chariots and horsemen who are strong, but not looking to the Holy One of Israel, not seeking the Lord, we read this in verse 2, yet he also is wise, speaking of God, and will bring disaster, and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who work iniquity. And so God is wise, and he's going to bring disaster upon his enemies, and he's not going to call back his words. He's not going to take back his words. He's not going to change his mind, what God says he means and what he says he does. Every word of God is true and every word of God is the truth. We read in Numbers uh, in chapter 23 and verse 19, I'll read this to you. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He has said and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? And the answer is, of course he will do what he says. It's a rhetorical question. Has he said, and will he not do? Has he spoken, and will he not make it good? God can't lie. Whatever he says is true. Men will lie. He says God's not a man that he should lie, indicating that you can't really trust people. People will lie through their teeth so often. If they don't have that conviction in their heart, and they don't think they're going to get caught, most people lie. But not God. 
He's not like a man that will lie. He's not like us, the son of man, uh, that he should repent or, you know, be sorry for something that he says or does. God has nothing to apologize for. He has nothing to change his mind about. Everything God thinks and says is right and true. And God's not going to change for anyone. He's not going to change for you. He's not going to change for me. And so we could trust the word of the Lord. You could test all other so-called truths by the truth of God's word uh, because God's word is truth. John 17, 17 tells us. So he's not going to call back his words. He's not going to change his mind. He cannot lie. We read in verse 3, Isaiah 31. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall, and he who is helped will fall down, and they will all perish together. And so God was already warning them that, you know, both Egypt and those who Egypt is coming to help are both going to fall. And, and that's, that's exactly what happened. The Egyptians were not able to help Judah at all. And Judah spent all this money from the temple to go and buy an army that never even made it. Horses that ne- and chariots that never even came uh, to their aid. We read in verse 4. For thus the Lord has spoken to me. As a lion roars and a young lion over his prey... When a multitude of shepherds is summoned against him, he will not be afraid of their voice nor be disturbed by their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for its hill. So it's interesting that now God is speaking of himself as a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. As a lion roars and a young lion over his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is summoned against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor be destroyed or disturbed by their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for its hill. So God is comparing himself to a lion here. You know, Satan uh, is a counterfeit of everything that Jesus is. If Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah and Satan pretends to be a lion, he's the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, uh, Peter tells us about Satan. Uh, but Jesus is the real lion. He's the lion of God. He's the lion of the tribe of of Judah. He came as a lamb the first time. He's going to come as a second time as a lion to destroy the enemies uh, of God and those who hate God. And it's interesting that it's saying like a lion that has his prey, that he's standing over his prey, like he's got, a, 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 you know, something that he's captured, a goat or, or a sheep, and he's standing on it, and all the shepherds are coming and banging things and shouting and trying to scare the lion away. They're not going to scare the lion away. He's, he's got what he wants right there. He's not going anywhere. And God says, that's how I'm going to be for my people. I'm going to go fight for my people. No one's going to scare me away, and I'm going to protect and preserve uh, Judah. He's going to come down from Mount Zion uh, and from its hill. In Revelation chapter 5, we're told this uh, about Jesus, that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah who is going to come back and judge this world. We read in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And so we read in verse uh, 8 of Revelation 5, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. So he's a lamb, the lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world, and he's a lion. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lamb and the lion are one. It's Jesus Christ. It says, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sing a new song saying, This is saying to the Lamb, to the Lion of Judah, You are worthy, Jesus, to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. And out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests, or a kingdom of priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Verse 12, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. 
Jesus is being worshipped as God in heaven in this scene because Jesus is God and only God can receive worship. And so, uh, and he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, he is a lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, but he is also a lion who is going to come back and who is going to judge. And the Bible tells us that on that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone, even Satan himself, is going to have to bow down before Jesus on that day. Everyone, including the demons, everybody. And they're all going to have to bow down before Jesus and declare that he is Lord of all. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so he is the lion uh, of the tribe of Judah who is going to come back and who is going to save his people. And so we begin to see here a dual fulfillment of this prophecy, as is often the case with Isaiah's prophecies. There was a local fulfillment, uh, a fulfillment that happened in the lifetime of the hearers or shortly thereafter. Uh, and then there would be a future fulfillment that is still yet future for us, uh, which is when Jesus Christ returns uh, at the end of the tribulation period uh, at the battle of Armageddon in order to save uh, Israel from the Antichrist and to save his people. We read in verse 5, Isaiah 31, 5, like birds flying about, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending, he will also deliver it. Passing over, he will preserve it. So he's like a lion that is going to fight for his people. He's going to come down to fight for Mount Zion. That's another name for Jerusalem and for its hill. Uh, and he's going to be like, like, like birds flying about, like birds flying about. So the Lord of hosts will defend Jerusalem. Defending it, he will deliver it. Passing over it, he will preserve it. And we know that, uh, that an angel of the Lord came and an, and an angel of the Lord wiped out 185,000 uh, of the Assyrian soldiers after this prophecy was given. Certainly that was a fulfillment of this prophecy. Um, they didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to fight. They didn't have to lift uh, a, a finger to fight against the Assyrians. God did the fighting for them. The modern state of Israel actually looks at this prophecy in, a, in an interesting way. In 1917, when the Turkish Empire was collapsing at the end of World War I, the Ottoman Turks had ruled for 400 years over Jerusalem. Muslim Ottoman Turks from Turkey had ruled over the Ottoman Empire from 1517 until 1917, 400 years. And at the end of World War I, the Ottoman Empire was just collapsing. And so they were, they were losing everything that they had gained, and they were basically uh, losing their empire. And they were trying to hold on to Jerusalem because the Ottoman Turks and the Muslims had controlled Jerusalem for 400 years. And, of course, the Christians want control, the Muslims want control, the Jews want control, everybody wants control of the holy city of Jerusalem. And so when the British were coming in to conquer Jerusalem, in 1917, General Allenby, who was a Christian man, uh, who was the, uh, the general of the British Army at the time, uh, he did not want to bomb Jerusalem because it's a holy city. It's a 2,000-year-old city. It's where Christ was. And he was a Christian. And so he had his airplanes and, you know, he had uh, planes flying over to surveil to where they were going to pinpoint and target uh, the enemy's locations, and they were going to bring the artillery in, and they were just going to blast the old city of Jerusalem to smithereens in order to drive the Ottoman Turks out like they do in war. But this general did not want to have to fire any shots. He didn't want to have to destroy the city in order to take it from the Turks. And what happened was is when the Ottoman soldiers or the Ottoman army, who had already been badly beaten and their empire was collapsing anyways at this point, they probably were pretty hopeless about winning this battle. When they saw the planes flying over, they became scared that these planes were going to start dropping bombs on them. And so overnight, they all left the city of Jerusalem. They just fled overnight. They, the, the, the British came in the next day and they were all gone. The Ottoman Turks were gone. They just abandoned all their positions and they gave up the whole city without a fight. And the Jews look at this as a prophecy of this, that God said he would protect Jerusalem like birds flying about, so the airplanes flying over. So will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending, he will also deliver it. Passing over it, he will preserve it. It was completely preserved in 1917. Not a shot had to be fired uh, in that sense to, 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 to bomb them out of there. There were shots that were fired uh, in Jerusalem. You could still see the bullet holes in the walls there uh, fr from some of the firefights. But it wasn't bombed. It wasn't shelled. And so the Jews looked to this as a fulfillment uh, of this prophecy uh, in modern times. 
We read in verse 6. Return to him against whom the children of Israel has, have deeply revolted. So God is going to defend them. God is going to fight for them. God is going to preserve them. God is going to preserve their city. He's going to do all this for them, even though they don't deserve it. And so the prophet is telling the people, return to him. Return to the Lord. Come back to him. Against whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. They've rebelled against their maker. They've rebelled against their God. And, and you know, we, we often have to repent of, of things that we do, things that we think, places that we go, things that we say, you know, we, we, we don't belong to ourselves anymore. If, we're, if you're a Christian, you belong to God. And, and so he bought you with a price, and so he owns you. You're his, you're, you're his possession. I'm his possession. He gets to call the shots. He owns me. I'm his slave. I don't get to make the rules anymore. You know, you're either going to serve Satan, and he's a hard taskmaster, and sin will destroy you, or you're going to serve Jesus, and he's, he's a good king, and he's a good lord, uh, and he's a good master, but he's still your master, and you're still his slave. And so oftentimes we have to repent and we have to turn back to God and humble ourselves before the Lord as his people. And we have to return to him in humility. In Psalm 75 in verse 2, let me read this to you. When I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly. I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully, and to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one, and he exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out, and surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. And so the Lord opposes the proud. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. In Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 1, Isaiah tells us this. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities, your sins... Have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear you. And so our problem is our sin. Our sin gets in the way of our relationship with God because God is righteous, he's perfect, he's holy, and we're a mess in our sin. And so we have to come clean. We have to be honest with God and, you know, just confess with your mouth the things that you're convicted of if if you confess your sins he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness but if you say you have no sin you're a liar the truth is not in you according to first john chapter one and so he's he's telling them he wants his people to change their mind to return to him to repent of the things that they've done it's not that god can't save it's not that he cannot hear but it's, it's your sins have made a separation between you and your god we read in verse 9 uh, this, this uh, sin that's confessed before God after God says this, that your sin is in between you and me to, to Judah. He says this in verse 9. Therefore, justice is far from us. They're, they're confessing the national sin before God. Nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at the noonday as at twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. Isaiah 59, 11, We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, in departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off, for truth is fallen or has stumbled in the street, and equity cannot enter, so truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey." So this is the nation being honest before God. That was their condition. They were a wicked nation. They were unrighteous. They were unjust. They were not 
uh, concerned for the things uh, of the Lord. And so it made them like blind. They couldn't even see in the daylight because eventually that, all this sin catches up with us. He says, justice has turned back, righteousness stands afar off, and truth has fallen in the street. Sounds a lot like our society today. There's no more justice in our judicial system. It's whoever has the money wins. The drug dealers are the ones who get off, and the biggest drug dealers are the pharmaceutical companies. And you can't even sue them anymore when they poison you with drugs. You know, and, and so it's like, if you have enough money, you could win, you could buy judges, you could buy politicians, the politicians will appoint the judges for you, you know, and there's no justice anymore uh, in our society. There's no righteousness anymore. Right is wrong, wrong is right, black is white, white is black, everything is backwards. Good is evil, evil is good, as was predicted would be the case in the last days. Truth fails, and so, you know, you, you speak the truth, and they hate you for speaking the truth. Just for telling the truth. It's hate speech now. So how different are we than, than the time of Isaiah and, and Judah? We're really not much different uh, uh, at all than them. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. So as long as you're doing evil, you're fine. But as soon as you decide you don't want to do evil anymore, you want to do good, then they hate you. And they pounce on you and they want to destroy you. So we are in uh, good company. In Revelation chapter 2, this is the New Testament that we are told that we are to be those who uh, repent of the things that, 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 that we know are wrong, that we do. In Revelation chapter 2, when Jesus is speaking to the church here in Ephesus, he says this in verse 4. He says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. There's no leaving uh, or, or losing your first love. There's no losing your salvation. That's not scriptural. But you could depart from the faith. That's scriptural. And there's a lot of people I know. I've been a Christian a long time. I've been a pastor a long time. I've seen a lot of people walk away from the Lord. Wholeheartedly walk away. From, raised in church. Baptized in church. Married in the church. You know, whatever it is. Serving in the church. Some of them are worship leaders. Some of them are pastors. And then they become atheists. Or they, practice, they start practicing homosexuality and Buddhism. And, you know, and it's like, well, I mean, I don't know. You, you, you want to practice this lifestyle. You want to become a Satanist after you said you were a pastor or a Christian and you think you're still going to go to heaven now that you're a Satanist, you're an atheist, you're practicing witchcraft and these abominations before God and you think that you're okay? I don't know. I mean, the Bible, I'll let God be the judge, but the Bible says you'll know a tree by its fruits. And the Bible warns us that those who practice these sins of the flesh are not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so your argument's not with me if you want to live in this lifestyle and think you're a Christian. Your argument is with God. And so really we have to be honest with God and we have to repent of the things that we know are wrong and we have to return to the Lord. We have to humble ourselves. And there's no losing your salvation. But you certainly still have a free will to walk away from Jesus. Now whether or not they were ever saved beforehand, that's a theological question I can't answer. That's only God can answer that question. Or whether they're going to get saved and come back to the Lord on their deathbed, I don't know. All I know is Jesus says you'll know a tree by its fruits. So we have to answer to God for, for our lifestyle. He says, I have this against you in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 2. He says in verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. So he says, remember from where you've fallen, repent, which means that you agree with God and you repent of what you're doing. You, you get off that road and get back on the straight and narrow road that leads to life because you were on the broad road leading to destruction. You have to repent of that way, turn from it and go back to God and then redo your first works. Do again the things that you used to do when you were in love with Jesus and when you had close, intimate fellowship with the Lord. The reason I bring this up is because this is New Testament theology. This is Jesus saying this to the Christians and to the church. He says this in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus again speaking in verse 15 to the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Very serious that Jesus says he's going to vomit somebody out of his mouth. That's kind of like out of his body. I mean, that's a vomit out of his mouth, Jesus is saying. Very serious warning. For the lukewarm Christian, he says, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because you're neither cold nor hot, you're lukewarm. Because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel to you to buy from me gold refined in fire 
that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And then this is what Jesus says to all of us. Verse 19, Jesus says this, As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Don't let anybody tell you that in the New Testament, Christians don't have to repent anymore once they're saved. That's just not true. Read the book of James. There's a lot of repentance that's necessary when we are doing the wrong thing. We have to repent and return to the Lord. And um, we have free will. Every day you wake up, you make choices, and so do I. So G- God is telling us he, he, he doesn't want to punish us. He doesn't want to hurt us. But he's saying he, he, if he loves us, he's going to rebuke us. And he's going to chastise us or chasten us. Hebrews uh, chapter 12 tells us like a father disciplines his own children. So God disciplines those who he loves. If God doesn't discipline you, you're not his child. If you're his child, you're not going to get away with things because he's going to discipline you. So it's, and it's a good thing when the Lord keeps us on a short leash because we get into all kinds of trouble otherwise. So he says in verse 7, Isaiah 31, 7, he says, For in that day every man shall throw away his idols of silver, And his idols of gold, sin, which your own hands have made for yourselves. And so they're going to throw away their idols. And and this uh, this is apparently what happened after God wiped out the Assyrian army. The people then turned back to God. They threw away their idols. Unfortunately, within a few generations, they picked up all their idols again because they were buried in all the tells in Jerusalem when the Babylonians burned the city of Jerusalem and all the idols were there uh, at that time. We read in... Uh, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 20 about throwing away their idols. In that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks, into the crags of the rugged rocks, from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. Now this prophecy in Isaiah 2, 20 and 21 is talking about when Jesus Christ returns. And so I think that there is a dual application of the prophecy uh, in Isaiah 31 that they were going to throw away their idols then, but also Jesus is going to come back at the end of the tribulation period <clears throat> to basically uh, destroy the Antichrist and save his people at the, at the Battle of Armageddon. And at that point, Revelation chapter 6 tells us that when Jesus Christ is coming back, they are going to hide in the caves and they're going to cry out to the rocks to fall upon us uh, to hide them from the wrath of him who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. We read in verse 8, Then Assyria shall fall by a sword not of man, And a sword not of mankind shall devour him, but he shall flee from the sword. And his young men shall become forced labor. He shall cross over to his stronghold for fear. And his princes shall be afraid of the banner, says the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. So now specifically the prophet is saying Assyria is going to fall. It's going to have nothing to do with chariots or horses from Egypt or from your army. It's not going to be a sword of man. It's not going to be a sword of mankind, uh, but they're going to fall. And so it was an angel who wiped them out. Uh, We read in Isaiah 37 and verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, they they were all corpses. They were all dead. The entire army was wiped out by the Lord himself. And then we read about in verse 9, the fire of God. You know, uh, he shall cross over to his stronghold for fear. His princes shall be afraid of the banner, says the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. And we are going to uh, look at this a little in some more detail here um, on Sunday, probably. I'm going to dig into this a little bit deeper about about the fire of the Lord uh, and God being a consuming fire. We read in Isaiah Chapter 30, verse 27 and 28, the Lord speaks about his judgment coming with burning anger and fire. Behold, uh, Isaiah 30, 27, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger. His burden is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue is like a devouring fire. Speaking about the tongue of God, like fire. 
His breath is like an overflowing stream which reaches up to the rock to sift the nations with a sieve of futility. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people causing them to err. We read in verse 30, The Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard and show the descent of his arm with the indignation of his anger and the flame of a devouring fire with scattering, tempest, and hailstones. And so the Lord is, is often speaking about the, the fire that he's going to bring upon his enemies. Verse 33 of Isaiah 30. For Topheth, or the lake of fire, was established of old. Yes, for the king it was prepared. He has made it deep and large. Its pyre is fire with much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. It's like God's it's speaking of hell. This is the lake of fire, what he's speaking of. Tophet is uh, the Old Testament word for Gehenna, the New Testament Greek word for the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, that's where all the people are going to go after the white throat ju judgment, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, judged from their deeds, but their names are not written in the book of salvation, and so they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. It was created for the devil and his angels, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 25, the lake of fire. It's where Satan is going to go. It's where the Antichrist is going to go. It's where the false prophet is going to go, and everybody who takes the mark of the beast, they're all going to go to this place, to the lake of fire. Fire, and God says, I fuel this fire with my breath. I uh, incinerate this fire. I breathe like a stream of brimstone and kindle the fires of hell with the breath of God. I mean, that's pretty scary when you think about it. I mean, it's powerful. And so we're going to look at this on Sunday. We'll look in, at this in some more detail on Sunday. Our God, who is a consuming fire. Shall we pray? Lord, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord God, that we can turn to you in our time of need, Lord. We can turn to you in our time of trouble. When the enemies are all around us, Lord, and we, we're cut off from all hope, and we don't really see a way out, Lord, we can always look up because our redemption draws nigh. You are near to us, Lord God, in our time of need. You're near to the afflicted, you say. You are near to the brokenhearted. You tell us not to fear man who could kill the body, but to fear God, who could kill the body and the soul in hell. Lord, you, you tell us of the value of our soul. You say, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And, and Lord, we know that our soul is the most valuable thing we possess. And you want our soul for you, Lord. You want us to be with you forever. You want us to serve you, Lord. You want us to love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul, Lord God, and so we just ask, Lord, your blessing upon us. I pray for those here tonight, Lord God, who are struggling with sin or addiction or anything else, Lord, that they're in bondage to. I pray you would break those chains tonight, Lord God. You came to set the captives free. I pray, Lord God, that whatever we are dealing with, Lord, that we would lay our burdens and our troubles and our enemies at your feet, Lord. You do a much better job fighting for us and defending us than we could do fighting for ourselves or defending ourselves so, Lord, just encourage your people, strengthen us tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.